green images. You see, that's part of the problem. Uh, now, I'm Dibyesh. I'm from University of Westminster, London. So thank you to everyone for coming here. I was saying to Thalat uh, earlier that if no one turns up, that's fine. I can go and sleep because I haven't slept properly. <laughs> but I also know that once I meet people, then I forget to sleep. That's how things function. Now, so how many of you have... Okay, I want to know what your ideas about Kashmir. Ignorance is fine. So it's okay. What do you know about Kashmir? Bordering to Pakistan. Okay, so bordering with Pakistan. So one <laughs> aspect of when we study Kashmir is about borders. Okay. You think? Yeah. Uh, it's the northernmost part of India, or like the, yeah. See, I, I I I like the way he said like because okay part northernmost part of India for many Kashmir they did not say they are not northernmost part of India they are northernmost. Occupied territory of India. Yeah, like, I realized that. That's why I yeah, was yeah. like, uh, okay, mm -hmm. but that's before. That's what I. No, no, this, you know, when I this is why I said, you know, I, I do the same. That's why I said, look, this is important. That in a way, we are stuck with boundary, and we are stuck. We can okay, we cannot study Kashmir until unless we recognize we are also studying India and Pakistan. So when you mentioned borders, boundaries, India, Pakistan, so an imagination of Kashmir today without studying India and Pakistan and the way they operate as nation states is not possible. And yet at the same time, and I'm sure this is a shared sense we'd have, we would also not want to see it as only India and Pakistan. And what else do you know about Kashmir? So I can see India, Pakistan, territory, border, what else? Conflict with the central state. Okay, so it's about con it's about conflict, so yes. So we are not talking of a very happy, peaceful place, but we are talking of a place which is uh, which has conflict. What else? The wool, like they call some wool. Kashmir. Wool, yeah, Kashmir. So Kashmir, so we also know about in terms of resources, their cultural products of which Kashmir is known. Apples. Apples. Apples, yes. So Kashmiri apples are quite famous. This time... Uh, if you have to use dollar term, billions of dollars worth of Apple have been uh, destroyed this time because of certain political reasons, which I'll explain. Okay, fine. So now Kashmir, if you have to study, it is seen as northernmost part of India and connected to Pakistan, right? So, the, of course, as you can imagine, there were different perspectives on Kashmir. From Indian perspective and Indian nationalist perspective, it's very clear. India is one country which was occupied by the British. British played divide and rule. And because of divide and rule, Pakistan was created in 1947. So partition of India was a tragedy where you had to give up on your territory to Pakistan and West Pakistan, which becomes Pakistan and East Pakistan, which becomes Bangladesh. Right? So from Indian nationalist perspective, British rule leads to tragedy of partition but India is a secular republic and hence everyone is meant to stay in India as equal. That's the dominant notion of Indian nationalism. Jammu and Kashmir was a princely state that according to India willingly joined India. Right? So they would say that basically they joined us. It's a Muslim majority state with a Hindu, it had a Hindu ruler. So the Hindu ruler signed and joined India. So the Indian argument would be, one, India is secular. Two, the ruler decided. Third, since 1947, we have had, that's how they will say, we have had elections in which Kashmiris have participated, sometimes in high number, sometimes in low number, and therefore they accept that they're part of India. So all the problems in Kashmir are because it's proxy of Pakistan, that Pakistan is creating problems in Kashmir. That's how Indian nationalists will see it. Now, of course, there's a new strand of Hindu, it's not that new, but it's a dominant strand of Indian nationalism now, which is Hindu nationalism. It is far-right Hindu nationalism, which argues that India should not be secular. Kashmiris had significant autonomy within Indian constitution, and that was wrong, because they are Muslim, they should be shown their place. And the only way to show their place is to actually <coughs> remove whatever autonomy they had. Because in 19, after 1947, so between 50s, from 1950 onwards, India, through constitution, allowed for significant autonomy for Jammu and Kashmir. Right? That they did, officially. In practice, it got diluted, but in theory, they allowed for genuine autonomy. 
and what on 5th of august the new hindu not the new on 5th of august the hindu national government did they it completely erased it completely the autonomy is gone in fact status of jammu and kashmir is not only it's not autonom autonomous it's not even a province anymore the statehood is gone it's union territory it's directly ruled by delhi they have done that because in india broadly speaking there be two competing nationalism one would be the secular nationalism which would say everyone can be part kashmir should have autonomy but it has to be part and the hindu nationalists who said they have to be part the muslims if they do not want to be part of india they should go to pakistan or they should expect to be exterminated so hindu nationalism has a very clear ideology and in urdu it would say musliman ke do histhan pakistan ya qabristan so muslims have only two place pakistan so expulsion leave the country or qabristan so asymmetry extermination they are very clear about that that's the ideology right that's a far right ideology that's a ruling ideology in india right now so with the kashmir kashmir becomes even more important because that's the only muslim majority it used to be only muslim majority state and it's no longer a state so i said secular nationalism let kashmiris have some autonomy but they have to be part of india and for uh, hindu nationalism kashmiris have to be part of india they can be exterminated they can go to pakistan whatever it is but they'll have no autonomy that's what they, uh, they do that's what i mean in perspective now from pakistan's perspective again they would argue that the way indians say that kashmir is an integral part that without kashmir india will not survive we need it it belongs to us pakistan say it's a jugular vein that without kashmir we are not complete so we need uh, kashmir right so again something in common between the two that for both of them they need kashmir they want kashmir they claim ownership of kashmir but look at the land ownership they both are very clearly own kashmir it's a very proprietorial masculinist patriarchal view that basically they will you belong to us you don't want that's not our problem see and i would say very grand it's a rape culture it's a rape culture where the regardless of the consent of people you expect them to belong to you and be happy with it if they're not happy anyway it's not important you control them that's the way in which the two nation states operate and the two nation states operate in that sense not because india is uniquely evil or pakistan is uniquely evil or because that's a south asian affliction i would say and that's the, for those of you i'm sure you did it is affliction of nation state nation statism is based on certain masculinist patriarchal notions of possession where you belong to us right that's how it operate so in this case also now pakistan we can maybe do question answer expand more on that so from india's perspective it belongs to us pakistan is creating problem and pakistan controls one third and india controls two third and the parts controlled by china but it has no population therefore it has a different kind of uh, conflict that conflict is more connected to tibet and east turkestan so that's a different conflict right but in general india and pakistan competing over it in and pakistan's language is better than india's language because pakistan talks of self determination india doesn't talk of self determination Pakistan's position would be, and this is something you have to bear. Self-determination is good, right? Self-determination sounds good. Self-determination under UN. Self-determination under UN essentially implies India or Pakistan, no option for independence. So when Pakistan and pro-Pakistan, you would say self-determination. They essentially imply India or Pakistan. There is no other third option. And when India, of course, doesn't even acknowledge that, they say it belongs to us. So that's how it takes place. But fine, this doesn't. Indian and Kashmiri narrative, sorry, Indian and Pakistani narrative of control. Since 1990, from very beginning, there have been resistance to Indian occupation, very clearly, right? And also from time to time, resistance to Pakistani occupation. So resistance has been there throughout. Resistance in general was more constitutional, more peaceful in 50s till uh, 80s. From 89 onwards, there was an armed uprising. There was an armed uprising that was initially dominated by a group called JKLF, Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front, who, broadly speaking, ideology was independent Jammu and Kashmir. Now, the moment you have independent Jammu and Kashmir, it's expected that independent Jammu and Kashmir would have, of course, because it's Muslim majority, Muslim character, but it also would be secular because overall the population of the territory. is not muslim dominated it's muslim majority but muslim not muslim dominant you have got significant hindu sikh and buddhist minorities so the idea is only way to keep jammu kashmir together would be obviously independent secular 
Now, ideally, we can imagine end of nation state. But we have to also understand that as someone, I mean, I identify as queer anarchist, for me, nation state is a problem. Struggle for nation statism is a problem. But for those who do not have, uh, let me put it, for those of us with passports, we can afford to be sometimes more radical about nation state than those who do not have passport or those who occupy, right? So in this case, they're struggling for nation state because the dominant vocabulary of political expression in the world today is nation state, right? So in a way, while we are in solidarity with Kishmir, we have to acknowledge that. So even if, let's say, our ideology is anti-nation state, we have to be strategic and actually support struggles for nation state of those who are occupied. That's how, I guess, politics has solidarity has function. So in this case, there was an uprising. I said it was dominated by, broadly speaking, secular independent democracy. Then there was a strong emergence of a pro-Pakistan and more Muslim or Islam, what's seen as Islamist, organization that also fought. So you had practically war, civil war between the pro-independence and pro-Pakistan and India used that. See, India's ideology is Hindu-Muslim conflict supported by Pakistan will crush them. Pakistan ideology is it's Hindu versus Muslim, they have to be part of it. That's commonality. So both India and Pakistan have interest in shaping it as Hindu versus Muslim. And not a movement for self, not a movement for freedom, independence, or azadi. Azadi would be independent or uh, uh, freedom, not Indian freedom. And that freedom can be interpreted by different way, different people, right? But basic. Uh, so, 1990 there was an armed uprising, and Indian state's response was uh, around 70 to 80 thousand uh, killings, 80 thousand, right? So it's killing, extrajudicial, all of them, uh, disappearance. Eight to ten thousand people have been disappeared. You have got. Uh, documented cases of rape and sexual use of sexual violence against women primarily but also against men right torture in recent times blinding pellet blinding so and this is sort of not it's almost unique to India in terms of the scale of blinding so they use pellet guns which would essentially blind you right now of course India said it's non-lethal but they all the cases are, most cases are one of children being targeted and the eye being targeted. So you blind them in one eye or two eyes and then of course the entire family suffered. It's a collective punishment kind of thing. So they have been doing that. And you can think of collective punishment, think of Israel, think of Palestine, right? So collective punishment. I'll give you examples of collective punishment that exists. So 90s was a peak of armed insurgency and brutal violence by the state, right? By now, armed uprising is largely subsided. There are militants who <coughs> fight. But according to Indian government estimate, it's between 300 to 500. But the Indian military, paramilitary are between 700 to 800,000. It's the world's most militarized zone. So you could think that if you have only 300 to 500 militants, why do you need that much militarization? Because of course militarization is industry, it's business. It's good for the military, it's good for the state. So they've kept it militarized. Until recently, India indirectly ruled through democracy. So they'd have elections where sometimes vote would be 0% or 1% or 2% or sometimes 50%, right, depending on the situation. But they would say, oh, these are our democratically elected leaders and democracy is there. But by, after 5th of August, it's that even that's gone now. So, so India, in a way, I would say, India has been a colonial power in Kashmir. <laughs> colonial power, not neo-colonial, not semi-colonial, full-fledged colonial. Because colonialism is very much about, remember, asymmetry of power, paternalism, producing knowledge about others, using of violence, use of divided rule. India has been doing all of that. So it's India's colonial power. And on 5th of August, what had happened was that, in a way, it was stable. There were uprisings, <coughs> there, were, there was resistance, but there was no major threat to, even from Indian perspective, there was no major threat to India's control over Kashmir, frankly. There was no major threat. Because India is a rising power and India is sort of darling of various countries now in terms of alliances, it's a big market, most countries would not try to offer India. So India had managed to sort of control Kashmir, language around Kashmir. Yet on 5th of August, okay, on 2nd of August, Indian government asked all tourists, foreign and Indian, to leave Kashmir and all pilgrims to leave Kashmir on the ground that there's a threat, a name threat, right? Everyone had to leave, there was a scramble, but Kashmiris are not meant to leave. So you could see how they are already differentiating between Kashmiris and Indians, by claiming that Kashmir is India. Then on 5th of, and then they shut down internet, phone, everything, complete lockdown from 4th night 
And on 5th in the parliament, they declared that they're going to remove the constitutional provision that was providing autonomy in name to Jammu and Kashmir. And they did it on the ground that if we remove it, then we can bring development, we can invest more because uh, that autonomy essentially implied that if you're not Kashmiri subject, Jammu Kashmir subject, you can't buy land. So now anyone can buy land there. Except most people can't afford to buy land, as you can imagine, right? It's only the rich who do it, but at least that's the principle. Second, they said, oh, they are, we are going to liberate women there, we are going to liberate LGBTQ. The government did not say it. It's a far-right government. They have no interest in LGBTQ or women's rights. But their supporters, particularly in the West, are mobilizing the trope of, look, India, by removing autonomy, has actually liberated women and liberated LGBTQ. Right? And I'll explain how they do it later. But they did it. They arrested every <coughs> single political leader. And when I say every single, including the most pro-India leader. So three chief ministers, chief ministers would be head of the province, three chief ministers of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, <coughs> who were all pro-India, remember? They are collaborators, they are pro-India. They are the Indian politicians and they are Kashmiri ethnicity, but they are Indian politicians. They were under uh, arrest and they are still under arrest for 102 days. 102 days, all political leaders remain uh, under arrest. Now, that's one. You have got to be in three to six thousand children and young people in prison. Rather than being put in prison in Kashmir, they are being sent to India in prison. So then what does happen? Parents have to travel a lot and go and at time when phones are not working. For first 50 to 60 days, phones are not working at all. Now, some phones are back, so you can, like, I, you can call. But internet is still not there. So there's no internet. So it's a land without internet for 102 days now. now no, SMS time, no SMS either. No SMS No SMS, yeah. So no SMS, no internet. Only if you have post-paid phone, and remember, most people in Kashmir would not have post-paid. They're a prepaid. Like, you know, you need to have use voucher. That's not there. Except the post-paid ones, the, then the phone company said that you have to pay the due of last two months when they were not able to use it, right? So it's everyday siege. And India, and of course, for the first time, you've got international criticism or questioning of India, what is happening. The way to understand why India did it right now, I said, India was not facing any serious challenge. India did it because, and I, I wrote an article a bit of that, it's a dress rehearsal for a wider project. That's to make India into Hindu state. By doing it, and remember, constitution protected Kashmir status. By changing constitution within one day through the parliament, they did it within one day and then no one has succeeded that. And this was a big controversy. How did they manage? They got, except for the left party, they got, and the set, oppos main opposite, they divided it and other parties said, oh, because it's a matter of nationalism, we should side with the government. They converted this into one, and this is what the project in India is. The project in India now is one leader, one party, one nation. And you could think of what it reminds you of, right? So it's very clear, Narendra Modi, is the BJP, is the nation. So if you criticize Modi, you're anti-national. If you criticize BJP, the party, you're anti-national. And of course, in democracy, you're meant to criticize your leaders in any case, but you should not be seen as anti-national because then the, all kinds of laws would be imposed on you and brutality. So that's it. It's, it is moving in direction of Nazi Germany, very clearly. Mm -hmm. And I used to talk of this Nazi, and there are a lot of similarities, by the way, in ideology. And people would think it's exaggeration. But now, of course, a lot of people recognize that's what's happening. So the reason they did this to Kashmir, of course, is because they know that international communities, patients, or interest is short. Fine, for 100 days, people will say, after 100 days, gone. Who cares? Right? That's how what they're expecting. Pakistan at this time is weak, so they think that they can't do much. What they have done now, of course, is they've mobilized, at a significant level, Indian opinion against Kashmir. In 1990s, so I was in India in 1990s, I come from India originally. In 1990s, when there was armed uprising and India was fighting a war in Kashmir, we didn't know what's happening. So we were kept ignorant. Correct? Now, ignorance was still not that bad. What's worse now is there's a mobilization of opinion in India, but that's against Kashmir. So this is where you have a situation where, for instance, uh, you know, uh, what is it called? Human shield. India, so there's a India has been using human shields in, uh, in Kashmir, but there was a clear picture of a man being used, put, put in front of a jeep and being driven and a human shield, right? It's illegal by all kinds of laws. Not only was that person awarded by the military, 
the politicians justified it and actually there was a sort of a temple kind of thing built for that particular military official right now what social media and media shows is that and many Indians are saying we should do more this is not enough you should shoot so you say okay they really shoot, kill, genocide, right? So there's a call for genocide again and again uh, against Kashmiris. This is what I mean, that the difference between the secular nationalists in India who were oppressive and occupying and colonial and the Hindu nationalists is the former were controlling, but they actually pretended to not want to kill, right? And this Hindu nationalist ideology is very clear that you have to exterminate if required, if not completely vanquish. There is no dignity, you have to crush them. Now, one other aspect of this uh, change in uh, Kashmir is secular colonialism. The idea is, it's Muslim majority dilute the population of the majority there. That's why you can sell land, you can buy land and whatever, right? And how do you do that? You do it by encouraging people to move in the name of patriotism. Now, if it's a conflict region, you know, most people will not move. It's difficult. But then if you sell it as patriotism, that is good for you that you do it for India, then you will do it. If you get concessions, you'll do it. An example of that is uh, Xinjiang, East Turkestan in China. In 1950s, the population of Uyghur Muslims were around 90% and today it's around 45%. It's not by killing Uyghurs that population has changed, it's by encouraging Han and Hui migration. And the migration was? In Kurdistan, they did the same thing, but in the civil war in 2015, they tore down the cities. In Sur, especially, they had a curfew for 100 days. Yes. I, I work closely with the Kurdish freedom movement, and a lot of us do. And it sounds exactly the same. They do the uh, demographic changes by like bulldozing in the cities, call for civil war, and then they don't rebuild the houses. No yeah. insurance company pays out any money, and it's mostly in poor neighborhoods. And then people are forced to move to relatives in Istanbul, to relatives in, and, the, and that's an easy way to kill the resistance yeah. and to make the demographic change they need. Yeah. And it's the same in the mountains, in the small villages that have maybe worked with close with TKK, maybe not. They accuse them of it, dry them out. Yeah. Yeah, see, in fact, see, the reason I'm going to I was going to come to this is look, think of So the idea would, how, I need to, but why would Indians do this, right? India, the land of yoga. Do you do yoga, any one of you? I used to think of doing yoga. I stopped doing think of yoga thanks to Narendra Modi. They have turned yoga into a very Hindu national spectacle. That doesn't mean yoga is bad. It's just that that's how it's uh, mobilized. So I reacted, right? Okay. No, but land of Hindus, you know, cows or whatever kind of uh, stuff. But you know, in name of cow, they kill Muslims all the time now these days. So the ways in which you have to understand why would Indian public mobilize against Kashmir, given that they don't know who Kashmiris are, they mobilize because who are Kashmiris? They're terrorists. They are those who have been pampered. They have been given a lot of privilege. So they take away the privilege. And because they take how do you deal with terrorism? Only way to deal with terrorism is actually crushing them. Then they move out of Kashmir and they move somewhere else. Then they are always treated with suspicion there. So it's like with, you think that, okay, they move to Istanbul, but Kurds in Istanbul are not safe. If they keep quiet, maybe they will be safe. But the moment if they rise up, they raise voice, you'd have surveillance all around. Right? Anything goes back, not now, anything goes back and you'd have police coming and say, okay, what are they doing? They're the troublemakers, right? So in the Indian cities, Kashmir is seen as troublemakers and in case of Kashmir, generally they're more identifiable compared to India. So on 15th August, which is India's Independence Day and 26th January, which is India's Republic Day, one advice all of us, including I give to my Kashmir friends is, please don't go out because police will catch you because think they're your potential terrorists, right? So this is how. So it's suspicion, surveillance, securitization of Kashmir, outside Kashmir, and within Kashmir, it's a total occupation and control, right? And change of demography, that's the thing. Now, second is, of course, connected to Palestine. And uh, if you, the Kashmir, in, in Kashmir, have for last 15 years in particular, whenever there's an uprising in Palestine, especially in Gaza, they'll rise up. And as I was saying to someone earlier that maybe Kashmir is the only place outside Palestine where People have been killed during protests for Palestine. Three years ago, there were three Kashmiri boys who were killed by the police who were protesting for Gaza. Right? Now, why would Kashmir identify with Gaza? Right? As, in fact, I would say that Kashmir situation was more like West Bank, now it has become Gaza. That's the transformation that has taken place. Right? It's a very brutal kind of thing. 
So commonality would be settler colonialism kind of ideology. So commonality is among the within the struggle. But bigger commonality is the behavior of India, in this case, behavior of Turkey, in some case, and behavior of uh, Israel. Mm -hmm. Commonality would be seeing your nation state as superior. You cannot be challenged. Seeing yourself, not in case of Israel, but in case of Turkey and India and China and Pakistan and others, I mean, the other kind of a victim of Western Westernism. Mm -hmm. Or in case of Israel, you can be victim of everyone else. Right? The idea is you're a victim. So you are a victim and the only way not to be victim is to be strong. And only way to be strong is to keep your occupation as tight as possible. And only way to keep your occupation <laughs> tight is of course militarize, brutalize, dehumanize the people there. But crush the resistance. But also in a way control the mind of or the public opinion in your own country. And you do that by always portraying them as enemy. Right? That's the commonality we find. In fact, uh, more than Palestine, because Palestine, uh, we see, see similarity between Kurds and uh, Kashmir in terms of the ways in which resistance is taking place and the ways in which, uh, of course, Kurds are, we have got it like the four occupiers, right? In case of India, there are two occupiers. But right now, you have similar kind of dynamic going on in terms of ideology, because the ideology of AKP is the ideology of BJP in India, idea of Erdogan. And you, you hear him speak about his notion of gender, his notion of sexuality, his notion of how the Remember, he's part of NATO. Turkey is NATO. So, I mean, I try to tell you, but if you're NATO, then you are West. So, Turkey is Western. So, through this whole imagination that Turkey is victim of West doesn't work because they're part of NATO, right? So, you have got similar ideology, similar notion of treating minorities as, at best, they should keep quiet and at worst, they should be crushed. That's a commonality between all, right? So, the way I would say, and maybe we can have more questions soon, is in terms of Kashmir, and again, there's a place when all these human rights abuses take place, that human rights abuses take place because there's no self-determination, no freedom. But the struggle for freedom becomes urgent because there's so much of rampant human rights abuse. So in a way, let's say, if I think of uh, Scotland, there's no direct denial of human rights, so there's a struggle for uh, separation and everything. That, I would say, it's not it depend on Scot people in Scotland, but it's not urgent. But in case of Kashmir, in case of Kurdish people, in case of Kashmiris, in the Tibet and the Uyghurs, you know, or, or, or Palestine, it's urgent. It's urgent because, of course, there's rampant human rights abuse taking place. And in case of uh, Kashmir and then uh, with Kurds, and we know with Uyghurs and Tibetans and others, there's also this whole demographic transformation argument. And another, uh, in, uh, in, in, in case of India now, what I find interesting, they use the language of liberation, but then that's what they always do. Remember, when China occupied Tibet and China occupied East Turkestan, they said, we have liberated. But then, when Queen Victoria's rule was proclaimed over India, she said, we have liberated India. No empire goes to say that we are here to kill you. They always said, we have to love you and we are here to take care of you because you don't know how to take care of yourself. Right? So that's a commonality. That's a commonality where it is about paternalism. You're not fit to govern yourself, we will govern you. And if you resist, if you're good, then I'll treat you like a school kid and maybe educate you. And one day you'll be equal to me, but that day will not come unless you resist, right? And the other option, of course, is if you're a brat, then we'll smack you. If you're worse, we'll kill you, right? That's the broad colonial framework. That's what these nation states do. So if we have to resist, and I say resist uh, occupations, we have to also be aware that urgency of resisting occupation comes from the emergence of new fascisms. That Turkey is an example, uh, India is an example now, right? Other countries also, but these countries are examples. So when we study populism, we often talk of populism in uh, uh, Orban, we talk of uh, Trump, Trump comes up again and again. Frankly, I, mean, I, have to, I shouldn't be there, but Trump is a baby, oh, baby is right or wrong, but uh, Trump is a baby compared to <laughs> Erdogan and uh, Narendra Modi. The kind of power they have, the kind of especially with Modi now, more than Erdogan. But with Erdogan, you have got opposition parties that have not given up, right? To an extent. Not enough, but they... Not, yeah, but they don't challenge. But see, then, <laughs> the Kurdish issue, for instance, is one on which even the main opposition side with the government, start siding with the government, or they will not oppose it, right? So the Republicans will start siding with the Islamists <coughs> on the ground that, oh, the, Tur the Kurdish issue is a nationalist issue. In case of India, again, something similar, Parties will oppose uh, Modi on the ground, but say on Kashmir, we have to be one nation. So you have similar situation. So there's, I said, the urgency of this comes from the idea that there's, we have full-fledged fascisms emerging in these countries. 
Resistance is there, no doubt. But resistance is quite scattered, quite divided, and quite confused. Now, in case of India, you have got, for instance, civil society, left groups, and other groups, Dalit groups, and others, who are challenging Hindu nationalist project. But they're all divided. And this is where the strength of the Hindu nationalists comes. They will divide you. They keep dividing you. Okay, fine, you're left, fine. You're Dalit, you're this, you're this, you keep divided. And you fight against each other, and you don't fight against me. And now, of course, Hindu nationalists are not simply Hindu nationalists. They are backed by corporations. <coughs> but they also know that if any big business is going to challenge them ever, they'll crush them, which is similar to Russia or China. You find in the case of Russia and China that you might be an um, oligarch or whatever, but the moment you start challenging the main leader, you'll be taken out, right? So that's what they have been doing. So the urgency comes from emergence of fascist kind of ideologies in places such as India and other places, right? That's one urgency. Second is because we are dealing with humanitarian crisis. That in case of Kurds, it's so obvious. In case of Palestine, it's so obvious for so long. In case of Kashmir, it has become urgent. That Kashmir has been suffering occupation, but humanitarian crisis is more recent. And this is where India has been very clever. Because you never see India's thing as urgent because India is a democracy ultimately. You know, you've got fumbling thing here and there. You've got judiciary that sometimes passes uh, judgments against government, they do. Not on crucial issues, but on some issues, right? So, the way I would say it, I mean, how to build solidarity, right? How to build solidarity, I don't know, you have to tell me. How should we build solidarity? Okay. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we, as I said, we have worked with the Kurds movement for a while. Uh, I personally would work uh, since the occupation of Kobane, 2014, with ISIS. And I, I have seen what of course, it's like practical thing. We are helped with uh, the first thing we did was uh, clothes for people in Kobani. Mm. But I think also uh, and one one of the most important things we have done is the political exchange, and that's why the Kurdish freedom movement, like the PKK, YPG, or and and especially the civil society, that you work together as one as an international movement. We have like translated Abdullah Öcalan's book about the nation state, about yeah, women's liberation, that you build solidarity in exchange, not because you pick the people. You understand what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and I, I, of course, I feel sorry for the Kurdish people. That's, I, I don't mean, but you should build a movement that's built of, on respect, on exchange, and on, yeah, on, on a political base. Yeah, I think that's what's the most important thing is, and that's why I also think that the Palestinian movement with Hamas, for example, is hard for a lot of people to connect with. If you compare to the 70s with the PLO and Fatah and the socialist movement. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, my answer is that a political exchange is the most important stuff for building a strong solidarity movement. And that's why I think Roshaba has been successful in their political support from different things. And this is why it's seen as an enemy by Turkey, in particular, and by almost every nation state, right? I mean, the Turkey, of course, is a key one, but you have got Syria, you have got Iran, and then you also have US and others using it, abusing it, because, of course, the democratic experiment there is a threat to all kinds of dominant ideologies, right? So, one is about, which you get is, solidarity has to be based on, first, knowing about each other. Second is exchange. Third would be it's political. It's not about sharing everything, right? So for instance, I identify as queer. For me, I may not have something in common with you because for whatever reason, you're not queer and you don't believe in queer identity or you think that's secondary, that's not most important, which is fine. I mean, it's understandable we'll have differences. We can never have similarities all the time. But the question is, if we have an essential recognition of basic humanity, that I'm human being, you're a human being and we all have right to breathe, and live and be treated with dignity. I think that's the basis on which solidarity can be built. Now, and I think you, you, raised, you raised an important point in terms of, in some cases, easier than others, depending on our ideology. So if you are not a left person, then it's easier to build solidarity with some other organizations. Isn't it? So it's about our ideology. But with Kashmir, again, this is a challenge, I would say, for us is how to fund, because most of us don't know, don't know much about it, right? So, unlike Kobane, where you could go at one point in time, with Kashmir, it's very difficult to go without getting Indian visa. It's a, it's, a, it's a different kind of struggle. 
So the way I would say is international solidarity with Kashmir would be slightly different from the revolution, no, the Vijayarajaba revolution. It would be more about knowing, providing platform to people from Kashmir as much as possible. Not so much going there, but actually getting them here, letting them speak and sticking, I would say, it depends on them. So in a way, let them say what they want, but always prioritize human rights. That doesn't mean don't prioritize freedom. Freedom, of course, is part of it. You know, without freedom, human rights are not relevant. But I said, for strategic reasons, for those who are living under Indian occupation and who will have to come, go out, come back, they might use the language of human rights primarily, and which we have to understand. We have to understand that sometimes the language which we think is not radical enough is actually very radical, given the context. But for some time, I mean, as someone with privilege, I said, I've come from India, I'm, I'm okay, though it's the only unprivileged thing I would be in my queer identity, otherwise it would be very, you know, male, Brahminical, whatever, all the privileges that come with my identity. I can afford to be very radical. Mm. And it's easy for me. There's no cost. I can just smash this, smash that, smash this. But people living there, people living under every rock, we have to understand that they might not be able to say it, though their everyday survival itself is more radical, right? So I think the solidarity part would be important that we know, we find out, we work with people, we provide platform to them, we understand that no one is going to be perfect, no movement, they will never be perfect, but that's not the point. What else? Do you have any questions or comments? You might have, I said, you might not know about mm -hmm. Kashmir, you may have interest in other ideas. You were saying that in the West, uh, uh, Indian nationalists portrays that India is doing so in Kashmir because they are also promoting LGBTQ rights. Uh, and you said, I'll tell you. To oh, yeah. Do you have that picture? So, okay. okay. This, uh, but this came as new, but it shouldn't come as new. But if you know anything about pink washing and homo nationalism, especially with Israel and Palestine, then it will be familiar to you. But I had not thought of it in Indian context, right? In India, homosexuality was criminalized until recently. Then the Supreme Court passed a judgment. Okay. A few years ago, a High Court passed a judgment saying that that criminalization is wrong. Law should be removed. The government appealed and Supreme Court passed a judgment saying that no, no, it should remain on track, that it should be criminalized because it's against Indian culture. Right? Then there was a re, there was an appeal and there was a bigger bench of Supreme Court that said no, they decriminalized it, right? So finally it was decriminalized only a year ago. Only a year ago, right? Now what do you have of course is because Kashmir has special status, right? Not all Indian laws become Kashmiri law unless Jammu Kashmir Assembly, the provincial assembly, would pass it. Now in this case, because it was about criminalization, criminal law, it would have applied to Kashmir. Now, this is recently, the, uh, you can't see me, I was sitting here, right? Um, we had an event at SOAS, School of Oriental. And I think yes, if we explain a bit about the property and the land. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so, Article 370, whatever the, the status was, basic thing was, what it says, outsiders cannot buy land. They cannot buy land. Uh, so that it remains, it belongs to Jammu Kashmir subject, because that was the agreement when Jammu Kashmir according to Indian uh, uh, apart point, join India. Like that was a, a part. So that's the rationale for India not being able to impose all laws. But over time, India had been imposing laws, it had changed things, and by now, de facto, largely autonomy was gone. So on 5th of August, when the Article 370, which is the constitution thing, was uh, basically diluted and finished off, after that, a new argument emerged that because of this, now, Indian laws are applicable, all laws are applicable, which means that it's equal for all women and equal for LGBTQ. And that's a spurious argument, as I said, because 370 was, sorry, uh, the decriminalization was about criminal law. That anyway would have been applicable, so it's not relevant. Anyway, so we had an event at School of Oriental and African Studies in London on, uh, in fact, it was something similarly titled, Resisting Fascism and Solidarity, something along those lines. So we had uh, two, well, a few key scholars, a Dalit, uh, two, Dalit, two anti-caste scholar, one scholar working on uh, internment of, um, of uh, more than 1.5 million people in Assam, 
on the grounds that they're illegal and everything. You had got uh, Kashmir, uh, my colleague Dr. Natasha Paul speaking about Kashmir, and you've got uh, Kavita Krishnan, a very prominent uh, uh, left activist from India, right? So we had that event, and I was chairing the event. We started the event about you know what's happening in Kashmir, and suddenly you had four or five masked people come in, Bajan, saying gays for JNK, right? And saying that Article 370 was homophobic. So their argument which they developed it and I said join it, whatever, but they didn't join. For two minutes, they were saying that India has liberated gay people in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, so we did ask them to sit in the room, why don't you listen to us, right? They didn't. They set off the fire alarm and then went. That's fine, you someone disrupts and you go, I mean, in a way I have dealt with these things, that was not there. And within eight months, we re resumed our talk and I started getting messages from Indian journalists, journalists in India saying that what is happening because they already it was on TV. So it was actually planted, the protest. So Indian TV channels, what they started doing was of course saying that how gay rights activists disrupted an anti-India and hence pro-Pakistan event, which was closed door event. It wasn't closed door by the way, it was a public event, right? Closed door. And what they did was I know that they started circling Natasha's face, Kavita's face saying that these are the actors. Imagine your TV channel, they circle the face and they keep highlighting this is Natasha Kaur, this, this, this is Kavita Krishnan, an anti India activist being paid to uh, spew venom against India. Yeah, I, think kind of thing. I, if I can explain yeah. a bit more. Uh, so, this is a SWAS, School of Oriental and African Studies in London. And who's sitting? Natasha Kaur is a most prominent Kashmiri scholar. And within Kashmir, the Kashmiri Pandit, you know, the minority within the Muslim majority. So she is a pro Kashmiri. So and then sitting uh, one of the most prominent Dalit leader ever, it's a grandson. Uh, what was his name? Yeah, uh, Ambedkar, Doctor Ambedkar. Doctor Ambedkar is one of the icon, biggest yeah. name of actually he, the person who wrote the Indian Constitution. His grandson is sitting there. Then Kuita Krishna mm -hmm. is a CPIM in a Communist Party. CPIML. CPIML is a Polar member. So she is a very a vocal person. So, I mean, it's like a prominent people sitting there uh, from the left perspective from uh, from India. So, and, all of it. And, uh, so that's and, and the leaflet they left, because they are, is it regre regressive left, you should listen to us. Right? So, they called us regressive left. So, the, the news channel, right? I said, for me, it was the, actually it was amusing. I said, what? It's like, what, what are they doing, right? Regressive left. And of course, as Kavitha and few of us have said, look, what are you talking about? This is the government that had actually always called for criminalization. So how could you justify behavior of a far right Hindu national government on the grounds that is uh, gay friendly, right? Whatever. So anyway, but what I'm saying, the ways in which it operates. In India, they have more or less controlled the discourse. But outside India, they can't. They can't control this so far. So what they did was they tried to change the focus of debate where on Indian TV channels, which is all about, uh, oh, somehow we are the anti-gay, anti-whatever, right? And can you imagine, so even while the session is going on, they, there's thousands of tweets, and my vice chancellor, I'm a university professor, my vice chancellor gets tweets, come, and the police get uh, tweets complaining against me and Natasha, my colleague, that take action against them. They're homophobic, and they are, uh, and my colleague, uh, feminist, I'm uh, you know, queer uh, myself, and they said he's homophobic, they're anti-women, because they are this. And of course, publicly, all of them who are posting are Hindu nationalists, Later, one journalist, I said, look, you, since you seem to know the persons, why don't you call for a discussion? They can keep the masks on, right? We can have a discussion how it's gay friendly or not. Of course, they didn't. They wouldn't. The reason for that is because they know that in the West, the Hindu nationalists will not get away by saying that, oh, we want to kill Muslims or, you know, we want some kind of uh, fascist environment. So they would use the language of rights. They use the language of human rights. That's what they've been doing, right? So this is a new move in the West where they would try to portray India, which is under far-right rule right now, you know, as I say, semi-fascist, moving towards fascist rule, as liberating compared to the Kashmir. And they tap into Islamophobia here by saying, look, think of it, Muslims, you know, those Muslims who are extremists, terrorists, anti-women, anti-gay, whatever, and we are liberating. Hmm. Where, and as I always say that, as a very publicly queer person, <laughs> I have felt more comfortable and I've never felt any threat or whatever when I've traveled in Kashmir on my own, right? Never ever. I've felt more odd when I've been traveling in India, which is my original country, amongst supposedly not Muslims, right? So this is what I'm saying. Anyway, coming back to this, 
So you have a situation where the Discord, they try to change the Discord. The problem they face is, I mean, I shouldn't say they're stupid, sorry, stupidity is the wrong word, but there's, there's no, no substance to what they say. Mm. So we had another, I mean, uh, so Nitasha, the Dr. Nitasha called, she was an ex, she was at a testimony in US Congress, and US Congress, with all the problems, actually did have a proper hearing on Kashmir. They're going to have another one. Most other countries have not bothered, right? But at least they're doing it. Now, in that case, when she spoke, you had a very pro-India person uh, who spoke and you could see through the falsity and lack of substance in it. Because basic principle is very clear, right? If you want to bring about any political change, you have to take consent of the people. You can't force. In case of Kashmir, India is forced. There's no consent at all, right? That's how it is. Anyway, sorry, that's a very long, long answer, but sorry. What else? Any other question? Jag kan gärna översätta på någon till känner sig säker på att prata på engelska så översätter jag gärna. I just told I can translate from yeah. British to English. Everybody is comfortable. Uh, has there been uh, solidarity movements outside of India uh, starting up? Yeah, now, in, uh, from what, in 80s and 90s there was, there was more solidarity. Right, in the beginning, 80s and early 90s, right? Because it was at peak and you had solidarity of different kind, but then it went down. What happened around mid 90s was, I said, because the Kashmiri movement became splintered, what would be seen as Islamist versus uh, the one wanting independence, it got it. And then there were Western tourists who were uh, killed, right? Kidnapped and killed. Kidnapped and In killed, uh, very odd like, kind of situation, which most scholars now point out that actually it was, it seems to be an insider job by India. But because of, of course, you know, how in the West we function is, oh, we have everything, we will support everyone. And the moment one of us gets killed, it has to be a white person, of course. You have a black and brown person, they like doesn't matter. You have a white person getting killed and suddenly the discourse changes, right? So what happened in mid-90s was you had abduction of uh, Western tourists, few of them, and then killing. And after that, largely the solidarity <coughs> thing disappeared. In recent times, and this is part of the challenge, I think it goes back to the you know, Hamas thing you pointed out, that part of Kashmiri movement has been seeking support from not only Pakistan, but OIC, Organization of Islamic Countries. And since they seek that support, and it would have certain Muslim identity, shared, shared Muslim identity and them, then what that leads to is, of course, I guess, other people who might not share that identity, feeling that this is not for them. That's part of it, right? But uh, in recent times, I think last four or five years, I have noticed a small scale like this. Right? This is also important. We had something in Norway, and Talat has been quite crucial in this part of the world. And But we have been trying to have solidarity, which is not competing with others. Right? Like, for instance, I am not comfortable with certain kind of uh, uh, men who, you know, who, who might say they are solidarity with Kashmir, but they use very religious vocabulary. I will not have connection with them, isn't it? I, I will not. But... My point is, they can do their stuff, we can do our stuff. So there's a, there's a small emergence. So in recent times, after 5th of August, you find even in US, you have Kashmiri diaspora that's more active now. Stand with Kashmiris, they'll come together. They're trying to build connection with Palestinians. With Kurdish, there's not so much so far. Can you think why, why, okay. Why do you think it would be easier to have solidarity, I mean, in this case, movement with Palestinians and not with Kurds? This, see, this, I'm saying as an outsider, so it's not judging people because remember, they are, we are de we're talking of people whose families are under siege. They have no contact or they have very limited contact. So it's not judging them, but I'm just thinking, this commonality is basically, in case of Turkey, it's Erdogan. Erdogan has a very, very, with a, I mean, I hate him, but uh, he has a very strong support base amongst people who think he's somehow the best Muslim leader possible. You have a situation, therefore, where, I mean, I've seen on social media, for instance, uh, some would think, but no, you should not criticize Erdogan because, of course, he's a victim of the West, he's a victim of anti, you know, he's a victim of Islamophobia, we need to support him, and Kurds get support from Israel, Kurds get support, that's how they will portray, and they get support from US, so somehow they are impure, which is a very problematic argument, but that's the, I would say, a Muslim chauvinist argument. So that's part of the problem why they would not be. But there have been more efforts to actually not work with each other. That might not be possible all the time. And there's no need to work with each other all the time. But it's more about not dehumanizing each other. I'll give another example. Last year, 
was it last year? La- yeah, la- last year, uh, yeah, sometime in summer, we had Parvina Ahangar. Parvina Ahangar is a woman who leads association of parents of association for parents of disappeared persons. That's her, right? So I call her my Kashmir mother. Uh, she's there. Her son was disappeared in 1990. So she documented everything. She's someone who was not uh, literate in to higher. So she didn't come from middle class. So she's not a typical NGO person. It's through her pain, and she always says that my movement is of pain. So and it's not it's a movement, not an NGO, right? So Associate parents of people, they you've got old women mostly, and it's old women and men, and they would sometimes say that look, you know, basically fathers don't care the way mothers care, right? So they would always mobilize that trope. The very strongly feminist, in one sense, though they'll use the language mother always because that's the language that can work with every society and state. So they come together and they work together in the protest uh, on 10th of every month and 30th of August every year because there's UN Day against enforced disappearance. So they pro- protest against that. They've been trying to do that. So when she came uh, to the London uh, one and a half years ago, and at one event, there were sponsors, uh, Pakistani rights activists who said, we are facing the same in Kashmir. So we are facing the same in Pakistan, disappearance. There's rampant enforced disappearance going on in Pakistan. So let's do something together. In fact, my suggestion was, no, don't. Because the moment you have got... See, geopolitics cannot be ignored. So, so a solidarity politics which is not mindful of geopolitics can become quite dangerous, right? So in her case, for instance, or in people's case, sometimes it's important that you do not... You have sympathy for each other. You have solidarity with each other, but you do not do anything about that solidarity because geopolitics will become very complicated. <laughs> Going back to the... I'm looking at why Kurdish thing, but this... This is a very, and this is where I think Erdogan has been quite successful. He has been successful in portraying himself while being Western, because he's very much part of the West, right through NATO, while being that and close to everything. He's managed to portray himself as somehow victim, and therefore his fascism and his occupations as more justified than the occupation by Israel or India or someone else. He also has a, the Turkey working out a lot with soft power. Uh, for example, in Somalia, in Pakistan, and soft power is when you use money and NGOs to build schools, to, to provide people with food, and Erdogan has been very successful with that, and big, especially in oppressed and poor Muslim countries, and, and yeah, like in Gaza, in Somalia, and I think in Pakistan, Turkey is also yeah. in these areas. I don't know. Probably in Kashmir as well, yes. He couldn't. Because no, he, yeah. they, he, they would, but he, he has expressed, he's one of the rare leaders who has expressed strong uh, opposition to what India did in Kashmir. He has done that. And, uh, I mean, in recent time, I, okay. I was invited, I was asked to, invited to a conference on Kashmir in Turkey, Ankara, right? So, which I'm not going to, of course. Because it was organized by an uh, by a think tank that uh, that talks of Nea, uh, that talks of new uh, Turkey, which you know the AKP thing. So basically, imagine and this would have involved very senior uh, government uh, leaders of uh, Turkey. So Turkey and Pakistan are working closely together to highlight Kashmir. So then highlighting Kashmir is fine, but you can see why they are highlighting Kashmir. So my only question, the person who invited me, I said, do you think I would be able to talk of the similarities between Kurds and Kashmiris? And talk of how that similarity, more than similarity between Kurds and Kashmir, the similarity between Erdogan and Modi and how we need to challenge. He said, no, that's not possible. That's not ideal. Fine. I'm just saying. So we, of course, have geopolitics. We have to be mindful of that. But I said, that's geopolitics. But actually, amongst pop, Erdogan has also been successful. Populist, you said, um, I won't say Ilhan Omar's position on Armenian genocide. Well, partly was connected to that. But we find them using scholarships. For instance. You have a lot of students coming to Turkey to study now. So far, what I'm aware, all of them happen to be Muslims. Do they happen to be Muslims or they're chosen because they're Muslims? I haven't investigated that. I have not had time to do it. But you can see that kind of soft power being used. Now, India, in a way, is also using soft power. But it has not been that efficient. One. Number two, it cannot use religion vis-a-vis other countries because its religion is not that popular anywhere else except among, among Indians. But what it has done so far, of course, is mobilize the idea of democracy. Look, we are democracy, you are democracy, therefore, of course, things can go wrong, but we will manage within democracy. They have mobilized that very well, and they have mobilized the power of market, or the promise of market. 
it's not power, it's promise of market. This whole idea is, look, you will challenge us, then you know all the deals which we have with Beaufort, so that was in the past, we are with this, this company, we'll shift somewhere else. So they've been doing that. So it's, it's a, it, therefore they also use soft power a lot in a very hard manner. But in recent times, I think this is where I think they might get it wrong. Uh, most of you will not be aware possibly. They only allow, they're not allowing anyone to go, foreign leaders to go and go to Kashmir. Foreign journalists are not allowed. Uh, they invited uh, 23, uh, MEPs, out of which you know, 26 MEPs out of which 23 were far right. So uh, the uh, the Poland is in a far right party, Spain's far right party, France's far right party, right? And one lived them from UK. Mm. <laughs> so they all went, and of course they went and saw what they had to see. Mm. But but you think, of, and this is where even for let's say mainstream Indian nationalists, what used to be mainstream is a shock that how could they do it? Because the previous time they were not associated with far right. Now they do as this far right. Why? Because of course they are the fellow travelers. The government in power is not right wing. It's a far right government in power in India. And every, I mean, election, they keep winning all the elections. And the prediction, they win even more elections. Because while they cannot improve a lot of people, what they've managed to do, they've managed to divide the opposition. They've managed to give this notion that they are the only nationalists there. And sometimes you have to sacrifice your livelihood for your nation. And they managed to do that. Remember, they never sacrifice their own life. Their own children never suffer. But they would say, sell that. And that's what's working there. I would, I would like, just yeah. like to add, actually, what's the Swedish connection <coughs> uh, if we come to Kashmir conflict? So Sweden is selling weapons to both India and Pakistan since 50s, 60s. I got the whole statistics data from uh, Svenska Fred. So by 2017, Pakistan was the biggest buyer from Sweden. 2018 was India. 2019, most probably India. So that's the statistics. Uh, uh, and you're talking about not in a million, there's a billions of kroner. What is eerily, what is uh, gone to Sweden from India and Pakistan. And Boofers, since 80s, you know, the center of Sweden, uh, Oluf Palme, he sold actually to uh, Rajiv Gandhi in 85. And that buffer is used up to today, every day, on a control line. I mean, if you look on the map, where the divided line between India and Pakistan, uh, side of Kashmir, it's called LOC, line of actual control or ceasefire line. So that buffer is gun is used every day. And army sitting in the bunkers, both sides, and who are uh, the victims, we Kashmiris, and not only uh, that's the buffers India got. So what Pakistan got is a SAP, Orient plants, you know, the high altitude radar plants. So this is very effective buffer guns in this side. And this is a SAP, Orient plan, uh, what is uh, radar based. So that is telling the position to, to the artillery exactly which position to fire. Mm. So in both sides, I mean, this, if it's just a Sweden, just imagine how many other countries are involved, Germany, France, England, America, Switzerland. I mean, all are involved. If Sweden is involved, I mean, uh, selling weapons, all are involved. Mm -hmm. So that is actually, uh, everybody's milking the, uh, the war. So we need to do solidarity campaign. We need to build with anti-weapon, anti you know, solidarity groups as well. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I can think of in the Swedish context, right? So for those of you who work in terms of anti-weapon and anti-arms trade, that's a comp that's something where it can be done more easily, right? So for instance, most people uh, campaigning against arms trade might not be directly interested in Kashmir or whatever, but at least they'd be interested in India, Pakistan, and you can also think of, we do talk of two nuclear power states. So it's a dangerous game that they play, right? And we now saw, and this was the first time that Indian Air Force did go inside Pakistan. The fact that the plane came down next time and everything is unimportant. That they actually went in and then came back, right? So you have to understand we're dealing with very odd kind of context there, but we are actually already involved. So our, uh, in terms of arms trade uh, activism, in terms of even, let's say, feminist uh, solidarity movement, the, for instance, if I think of uh, Parveen Ahanga, right? One struggle they all face now, and we are aware of it, is uh, because they're not NGO, their movement, their movement largely of women, and old men, old women and old men. You could see that they would not be very savvy, and I'm being blunt, they would not be very savvy in getting international funding. Anyway, they're not into international funding. So whenever we ask, what do you want? She said, no, no, we just need your blessings, we need your support. 
take our voice and carry it forward. So sometimes when I've met not only Parveen Ahangar, but other old women, and it's a communication which is odd because I don't speak Kashmiri. They speak not Kashmiri. So it's like through either you understand the language without you understand the language without knowing it. It happens, right? When you have that connection. Most of them they will say, look, our struggle, we have documented what we have experienced. We have documented our pain and suffering. Now it is for the next generation and outsiders to carry it forward. Never forget our pain. Now, in reality, I mean, we cannot, and you know, we can never ask them, do you think your son, son would ever come back? That's something we'd never ask. Right? But the point is, they have hope from international community. So when Parvina Hagar would come to London, she would only say, she said, there's no hope from Indian system. We have tried that all the time. The only hope is from international community. Some pressure. Now, for those of us who are aware, we know how dodgy international community is. I mean, it doesn't exist. We know it. But they don't mean UN per se or, you know, the court of justice or whatever. They mean people like us. Because if we cannot transform India, right, but at least we should not accept the Indian version the way it is, right? That's the least we can do. So sometimes with victims, all they need is for people to listen. They are here to us. So coming back to the feminist struggles, I said, you have a struggle led by a woman and led by not a woman, led by women. You have a struggle which is primarily based on pain and suffering of women. You have a struggle based on strength of women. It's not only pain and suffering. We didn't have that picture, but uh, there's an old picture of Parvinang where she's fighting and she's leading it. There's another one. She takes a stick and tries to beat a policeman, right? Now, you think, why did police not kill her? Why did you not hurt her? That's because, of course, she has also that mother figure status. And so... It's very effective to an extent. So, as I said, if, if we have a feminist movement here, which is looking for solidarity with people in Global South, let's be aware that often scholars from Global South or actors from Global South will be people like me, with a lot of privilege. I mean, I'm, I'm saying you have a lot, I may have more privilege than most of you, by the way, in terms of class and caste and all those status, right? You may have class privilege. I can always refer back to my caste, which is 5,000 years, or for millions of years, I'm the superior human being, right? So I'm, I'm making it a joke, but that's how it is. So you have to understand that the whole caste system also means that privilege. And most activists, most scholars, let's say from India here, are in background. That's why they can afford to be left. In case of India, they come from a Brahmanical background. That is why they can afford to be this. I don't mean they're not genuine. I'm just saying, I think I'm genuine, right? But I'm saying is, we have to be mindful. So we, here in case of Kashmir, you have got movements led by women, organized by women, affects women, and a struggle. So again, feminist struggle where we can connect. And an easy way to do that would be actually, not now, if you have any event later, we're looking for speakers from uh, uh, Global South, think of her as a speaker. She will not speak English, but she'll speak Urdu. But all I said, look, first time I invited her, I didn't know who she was until I heard about her and invited her. She spoke in uh, Urdu and there was a translation. The translation was very methodical, but not, the feeling wasn't there in the translation. But even without translation, you had one half of the room crying. And half of my room, I mean, remember, most of them couldn't understand what she was saying in terms of language, but they understood what she was saying. And... It was very multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, student body I had, and they were kind. So she's very effective. So if you're feminist struggle, you do it. Now, what other kinds of movements can build solidarity with? And I don't know, but see, I don't know much about Swedish context. You do. Well, this is uh, one of the biggest, but it can yeah. be easily connected. Easily. Because see, there would be, as I said, you know, the way you mentioned Hamas, you know, they're, they're always... Being, but in this case, it's relatively easy. And I also know that with some kind of connection and recognition and everything, recognition of one group or another, it means that basically thousands of people feel that they are being recognized. Now you say, but why would they be recognized? If they're in village and uh, she's another village. No, they do feel. They feel that world has not given up on them. And that is the most important thing. So when for instance, US Congress does a hearing, it's not that US Congress is somehow, and, uh, I should say holy cow, but somehow a very uh, amazing institution. It, it has its own politics, we know it. But the fact that there's hearing, and I was told by one friend who came out of Kashmir that uh, so in case of uh, Nithash, another who, go, who gave speeches, right, it was five minute intervention. Now there's no internet. So somehow when someone got it on phone and then they transferred from one phone to another computer. So almost everyone has watched videos. Right? So, so even without internet, they have managed to share and why are they doing it? Because for them, the idea is the world has not given up on us. 
and so long as that hope is there that world has not given up on us and there would be some solidarity i think we may expect change the day that hope is gone is a very dangerous day because then we don't know where the movement will go we don't know what would happen and this is why i think our role is very crucial in making sure that not false hope but that we keep that hope alive for people in kashmir but also us ourselves so that we can live and breathe i mean if you are not kashmir you are palestinian or kurdish so it's like you are more luxury right in some sense but how can we live with the knowledge that in our name people have been murdered the entire community has been destroyed or even if it's not in, in our name let's say you are swedish and you have no colonial history or whatever right even if it's still done in your name it's done in your name if not swedish name it's done in the name of certain bodies let's say white bodies being privileged with a non white body this is why it's important that we carry on the struggle Anything else? Yeah. Me again? No, sorry. <laughs> But if we get the reports from Rushala when we talk with comrades on the front line uh, that fight NATO's second largest army, and they talk every time they talk about the importance of the support from here, they talk about their struggle. Is we got a letter from a Spanish comrade who is uh, who was in the front of Serikane, I think it's pronounced, it was the big battle they resisted. For eleven days, I think, against tanks and air, air, aircraft and artillery, and she she talked about so much about the support that they know that they have support from the world. They're not talking about leaders. They're not talking about Trump. Yeah, why not you come in front and uh, explain the situation? Yeah, that could be better, I think. And they talk. Is it all right to record or? Yeah. Okay. And it uh, yeah, they talk so much about the importance of solidarity and that they feel. They know that they have the people support, and that's so important. And that that's why to show solidarity and to build bridges between people is one of the most important thing as we as the left can do to build a new order, to build yeah to build a new world order, to abolish the nation states, and to build communities that's yeah equal and connected. Because like you said about the mothers in Diyarbakir, it is called in Turkish. Uh, in Ahmed is calling Kurdish. Yeah. They have the mothers movement as well. They sit one time, I think, every month. They it's also a, have some stuff. Yeah, it's a kind of international movement. Yeah. You know, it's uh, actually same as uh, you no, know the mothers. The mother from uh, Argentina. Oh, what? What is? I I, I don't remember the, mm-hmm. the organization name. The mothers of victims or. Mm-hmm. But that's a movement started from sixties and seventies. So it's it's all countries exist. So it's not. Uh, so that's yeah. Yeah. So in a way, I mean, we, what you may think is odd that what, okay, what would you and I, what would our world do? I mean, we are unimportant, right? So why would anyone have hope from what we do, given that we cannot change government policies? But there's so much of hope. There's hope because it's symbolic. If it's not practical, it is practical. One day you said, you know, helping out people, we can do that, right? So I said for us, it's important to balance between helping out in concrete ways, and also then solidarity. as we know that most of the struggles are struggles over ideas and histories and stories so for instance if what do you think if we beat around kurdish issue or beat palestinian or kashmir issue once the states that dominate know that their story is not the dominant story so they might be dominant state they might crush people they might kill them but the stories are not going to be dominant once they know it you can see why from the resistance side there's hope and this is why i think yeah, i mean sometimes even i think but you know who am i why is it important but i really know it is important because that gives hope and it's also important that we learn and that you know we carry on the struggle yeah yeah anything else yeah yeah uh, a question about the bgp okay. like it seems like uh, all around the world where the, the nationalist right is is on the rise it's a response to crisis uh in the united states for instance the, the crisis of the us superpower and of uh, uh, some things in american society and so on and in turkey obviously also a lot of different crises uh, so i wonder how how stable do you think that the bgp uh, regime has uh, managed to become or is it like uh, this i think this maybe what question for uh, You know it is. Now, thank you for asking that. As in fact, my first book was on Tibet, and my second book was on Hindu nationalism in India and politics of fear. Right. So I investigated it a lot when BJP was not so important. Right. So I, I didn't focus on BJP as a political party. I focused on the organization behind it. There's a big difference. 
of course, all of them are right-wing populists, right? So they are right-wing populism and they talk about people and they criticize the liberal elite, the secular elite, the uh, whatever elite, and they say that democracy is controlled by the elite and we are representing the voice of the people. That's a common argument. But the difference is that BJP is a political wing of an organization called Rashtri Swayam Sevak Sangh, National Volunteer uh, Service, that started in the 1920s, around the time of Finno fascism. So they started and they had fascist uh, and they wanted strong leader at that point in the 20s, 30s, they used to praise Hitler and Mussolini a lot. So the difference with the, uh, let's say, you know, in the US context is that there's a stronger and longer historical background to rise of BJP. That's one. Which implies that even if economy goes up and down, it will have very limited impact because that organization is going to be there. That's the world's largest organization, right? apart from Communist Party of China, because that's a political party, right? It's the largest organization. It has more than 10 million uh, people uh, as members. That's one. So it's an exercise. It's, it's, it's a right wing, far right, paramilitary, fascistic organization that's behind BJP. In 70s, BJP did not exist as a party. There was another party. In 80s, this organization supported Congress which is supposed to be secular. And after that, BJP emerged, right? So BJP's trajectory has been rising with and without, there's no direct connection with economic growth in India. And we're talking economic growth in capitalist terms, of course, right? What the BJP has benefited from, of course, is, I would say they're the extremist version of Congress. Congress by 1990s had already become soft Hindu nationalist and neoliberal. BJP, used to be more uh, less neoliberal they adopted neoliberalism but they adopted with vengeance and then they promised more stability compared to the secular the secular congress while being neoliberal also had to rely upon you know votes of various organizations so hindu national party said we do not need to rely we can just build a strong nation so they fused all of that right so in case of india so unlike let's say us and other cases there were economic crisis and you could see the whole it's a myth the myth of uh, trump saying that he is representing the white working class. And you notice with also Brexit party in UK context, when they talk of working class, and they always say we are representing working class, they always imagine working class to be white. Mm. And I wonder what about black and brown working class? Right, but anyway, they are always this is working class. In case of India, that was not, that, that didn't exist. The uh, politics was more complicated, more dynamic. In fact, the government, uh, the previous government lost election when the economy was supposedly doing well. But what happened was, under Modi, so he came up with the idea and he did, they did, it was with a lot of corporate backing. Representing, of, at that time, the government as weak, as not being weak, and that not sort of representing India well internationally. And for, they didn't have economic reform, by the way, they didn't, because they know that doesn't work with the Indian public. So they simply said that they're corrupt, 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 corrupt. So we need to come up with a government that's not corrupt, that's more efficient. So they come to power on the ground that they're going to be more efficient. They have been very efficient, frankly. I mean, you have to admire the ruthless ways in which they have implemented efficiently the whole agenda of Hindu nationalism in the last uh, five years now, uh, six years. They manage it, the economy has been actually going down. So in neoliberal terms, it's not doing well. And yet they keep mobilizing nationalism very effectively and dividing opposition. So even if economy and you say economically, they should have lost the election. They're not losing the election. They do lose state assembly elections sometimes. They don't use the national assembly and the, all the predictions because there's a lot of support for him as a leader. So people don't vote for BJP anymore. They vote for Narendra Modi as a leader. This is why I said the danger part. Actually, even the party cannot control him now if it wanted to. It's not that there's no evidence that they want to. But it's one party, sorry, one leader, one party, one nation. That's the ideology they're building. Anything else? Thank you very much for everything. I said, uh, well, but no, hopefully, please, uh, through Talat and through me, I'm on Facebook all the time. My name is Dibyesh Anand. I'm the only Dibyesh Anand in the world. So if the second profile is a fake one, uh, you'll see me with uh, either a cat or my mom's picture or a queer or something like that. Um, so please feel free to uh, keep in touch. I said, if you have ideas, if you have initiatives, if you have an opportunity, not only ideas. If there's any way in which forms, and I'm making a personal, if there's any way in which you can find opportunity to invite and get, 
Kashmiri people from Kashmir, not now immediately, but it's very difficult for them to come out, frankly. They'll not be allowed. They're all kind of exit controls and put on them. But long term. And I would say in this case, feminist organizations, you know, human rights organizations, if you have any opportunity of inviting someone like Parvina Hangar or anyone else from Kashmir, please do that. And I said, Talat is here, I'm here, you can ask us for any suggestions, advice, and we are more than happy to do it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.